All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Kim Dorman. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator for the Princeton Public Library. And uh, as you know, we are gathering here this evening on Zoom. If you have questions at any point, please feel free to put them in the Q&A function uh, or the chat, and we will make uh, put them forth to uh, Ms. Hummel. Juanita Hummel is a Pennsylvania master naturalist, a volunteer naturalist at the Bowman's Hill Wildflower Preserve, and a longtime birder currently serving as president of the Washington Crossing Audubon Society. We're so delighted that she uh, was willing to come here and speak about um, gardening for pollinators and pollinators for everyone um, as the library is trying to shine a light on the importance of pollinators in ways that uh, we can support them in our world. I was recently speaking to some friends and they said, oh, Juanita is great. So I'm really looking forward to learning with you tonight. In fact, uh, part of the reason that we were a little bit late starting is because I was, I was learning wonderful things about Columbia. So thank you for joining us and uh, signing off. Thank you, Juanita. Thank you for that introduction. And thank you everyone for being interested in pollinators. Um, we're going to go beyond honeybees tonight. This little uh, thing, which I actually found while doing my PowerPoint presentation, is a honeybee. And it's kind of looking like it's supposed to be flying there. But there's way more pollinators in the world than honeybees. And in fact, uh, while everyone knows that honeybees are struggling, um, our native pollinators are struggling a lot more. And in many ways, they're even more important. So let's get started with what is a pollinator. So basically, a pollinator is anything that uh, carries, helps carry genetic material from the male part of the flower or the stamen to the female part of the same of the same or another flower, ideally. Most plants want to cross-pollinate, just like most people want to do the same thing for genetic variability, which is uh, more, uh, more in keeping with uh, uh, survival. Uh, there are some plants that can actually self-pollinate, and those are mostly in the spring ephemeral category. So these are plants that take a big chance by coming up very, very early in the springtime. Um, their plan is to get themselves pollinated, to produce seeds, to throw out some leaves, gather up some energy for next fall, and do all of this in a short period of time uh, when from when spring starts to when their woodland habitat becomes shaded by uh, tall trees. Sometimes that doesn't work out. If you have several days, of these, they're usually pollinated by bees, but if it rains for five days straight, which is about the lifetime of the flower, like it sometimes does in April, uh, or even March, if it's a warm year, these little beautiful little flowers can pop up in March, then the flower is able to self-pollinate. And it sort of the stamens slowly turn inwards and touch the pistil here in the middle and um, pollination occurs. Uh, trees use wind to pollinate. If you've ever been in Pine Barrens in uh, springtime and see those big drifts of pollen, it looks like yellowish, greenish uh, snow drifts by the side of the road. Uh, that's what's going on there. Uh, if you're going to just cast your your uh, genetic material willingly to the winds, you have to reduce a lot of it to make sure some of it reaches its target. And even uh, some plants even use water uh, to as carriers for the for their genetic material from one plant to another. Uh, the white water lily, this is a native plant, Nymphia odorata, uh, has an interesting combination of trapping beetles and using water to accomplish pollination. And uh, that's some, you could Google that uh, flower to see. It's really quite fascinating how all the steps this, this plant goes to to get itself pollinated. So pollination is important and plants have a lot of strategies that they use. But most plants are, in fact, pollinated by animals, including insects. Um, bees are very important. We all know that. And there are more than 300 native species of bees in New Jersey. And uh, little factoid, the state insect of New Jersey, which is the honeybee, is not native to New Jersey. The honeybees are Eurasian natives. They came here with uh, many of the Eurasian, well, particularly European plants. Uh, that we uh, use for our food. 
Um, butterflies and, and that include moth, Lepidoptera. Uh, there are 125 species of butterflies in New Jersey. Uh, not all of them are pollinators, mind you. We'll talk about a couple of ones that aren't later on. And we have at least 1,500 species of moths. In fact, they're sure that there are more. They just haven't all been identified yet. And some of those moths are pollinators. Um, and not all of them are pollinating at night either, as you'll see later on. Uh, beetles are something that almost nobody thinks of as being pollinators, but they are very important to some of the older plant families like uh, spice bush and magnolias. And worldwide, about 70,000 species of beetles are pollinators. So whoever thinks of beetles is as pollinators. Well, now it's time to think about them. Uh, bats, um, not so much uh, in the United States, although some bats are uh, associated with pollination of cactus in the West, but there are none in New Jersey. However, uh, um, there are 48 species of bats worldwide that are important pollinators, particularly for fruit in tropical countries. We also have one species of bird in New Jersey that is a pollinator. I bet some of you can guess what that is. If not, we'll find out later. Uh, but the reality is that 75% flowering plants and 35% of our food plants depend on an animal pollination, and most of that is insects. Well, I don't think I have to tell this crowd why pollinators, pollinators are important, but they, they do pollinate our food crops. They help us... Um, uh, have clean air by pollinating trees, and trees, of course, are the lungs of our planet. Um, they're also uh, important if you want a healthy economy, and who doesn't? And uh, this is um, this is uh, just a little fact sheet from um, from a, a government site which describes the economic challenge posed because of declining pollinator populations. Over the past few decades, there's been a significant loss, including honeybees, but also our native bees have are way down. Birds, bats, and butterflies are all way down. The problem is quite serious and is a significant challenge that needs to be addressed. And if you um, are a fan of Doug Tallamy, if you aren't, you should be. I'm sure many of you have heard of Doug Tallamy and read some of his books. Um, we are facing... Uh, uh, a situation where we've lost somewhere between 80 and 90 percent of our insects and a lot of those are pollinators and we need them you know if if uh, biological populations fall below a certain level uh, it becomes impossible for that particular species to continue to reproduce and then it's gone forever so the rate of insect, we've all heard that about birds, the National Audubon Society has been putting out a lot of good data about how we've lost about a third of our bird populations in North America. But the rate of insect, insect extinction is eight times faster than that of mammals, birds, and reptiles put together. So it's, it's quite serious. Um, I bet that if uh, there are any people here who were gardening 30 or 40 years ago and had a nice garden full of um, pretty flowers, that you saw a lot of butterflies. When was the last time you saw a lot of butterflies in your garden? And if you did, I bet they were not native. We'll talk about that in a minute, too. So in order to have pollinators and really... Again, my I'm a big fan of Doug Tallamy, everybody, he thinks that every, every bit of land that is not, now not currently paved over, have a building on it, must be put, to, put into use to create pollinator habit if we are to avoid the insect apocalypse that will affect every aspect of our lives. So the good pollinator habit is more than just pretty flowers that attract butterflies. You have to provide food for the adults, your adult pollinator, whatever kind of a pollinator it is. And that could be nectar, but not necessarily. Uh, and you also have to provide housing for the adults. For example, um, honeybees live in hives, but most of our native bees live individually in holes in the ground. Uh, some of them live in dead wood. Um, so 
if you so you have to think beyond just uh, you know I'm going to attract them to my yard and then leave them to their own devices after that you need to really need to give them everything they need you have to provide food for their offspring and, and uh, particularly butterflies and moths the food that the adults eat if they eat not all adults eat we'll talk about that too um, uh, the food that the adults eat is very different from the food that their offspring need when they are uh, changing from an egg into uh, into the adult uh, creature, whatever that happens to be. That's even true for many birds. A lot of birds eat insects when they're when they're hatched and then switch to seeds or fruit uh, when they grow up. And for non-migratory pollinators, the conditions must be such that they are able to survive the winter in whatever life stage they happen to be in. And it's not always as an adult. It's, it's sometimes it's an egg, could be a pupa, could be in a chrysalis. Um, and we are actually, this is one, one, way, one place we are, where we are doing a very bad job in helping insects survive the winter. We are getting rid of some of the things that they need and putting it in the garbage. We'll talk about that at the end. So here is one of our best pollinators. This is the Easter Carpenter Bee and it's shown on, uh, this is a swamp milkweed I believe, which is a very good pollinator plant by the way. Um, it is, uh, you'll see me, me showing you some photos of all kinds of different um, pollinators on this plant later on. And this is something you can grow in pots. It's called swamp. It, can, it, can, it likes to grow along uh, lakesides, ponds, streams, and things like that. And it can live in standing water, but it doesn't need those conditions. If you, if you germinate the seed under the right conditions, you can get the plant to grow quite well, even in a pot. It doesn't get quite as big as it does in the wild, but it will grow quite nicely in pots. It's a fabulous plant. If you're only going to plant one plant, plant swamp milkweed. It has a nice growth habit, too. It's not quite as weedy looking as uh, common milkweed. But we have the eastern carpenter bee, and this is a problem because... This is a bee that really enjoys burrowing into human structures. It's one of our biggest bees, by the way. It looks big here on the screen. It is a big bee. It has this big black uh, um, spot on the back and a shiny abdomen. If you, it, a lot of people confuse it with bumblebees, but I'll show you a bumblebee in, in a minute. It's much bigger than our native bumblebees. And if you have any a wooden deck or something, you may have seen these holes, and you probably have these bees buzzing around right now because right now they're in the they're in the throes of mating and uh, setting up their little colonies. And our deck is very popular with them, so they make a perfectly round hole. The female goes in, lays an egg, puts a bunch of pollen and some nectar into a little ball, and that's what the um, the larvae will feed on when it hatches. But before it hatches, in many cases, along come at my house. I live in the Sourland Mountains. I'm surrounded by trees. I have hairy woodpeckers um, in numbers, as well as downy woodpeckers. And the hairy woodpeckers come along, and they go into the other side of this railing, and they excavate out the, um, the larvae of the carpenter bee, and then you have a hole all the way through the deck railing. So this is a, you know, when I have a few minutes, I'm going to do some, um, some, a uh, little bit of a scientific study to try and find out what else I can offer carpenter bees so that I don't have to swat them with, with uh, swatters in order to preserve our deck. Because they really, excuse me, I have to go back here. Um, they, they're not supposed to like painted wood. This is painted. They're not supposed to like treated lumber. This is treated. They just don't care. They really like the deck. We've offered them pieces of wood separate from where it's attached to the railing. They're not interested. By the way, these bees don't, ha don't sting. The males buzz around and basically try and harass uh, anybody who comes near their deck. So that's what's going on. If you have these things around, you can, you can just grab them in your hand. They have, the males have no stingers. So they're all buzz, no bite. But so now we're trying to coexist, trying to coexist with these bees, but those are particularly difficult. And if anybody knows a way to attract them to something else, I would love to know about. So this is one of our native bumblebees. It's uh, got a little smaller 
uh, black spot on the uh, on its thorax, kind of like the uh, carpenter. Carpenter, I've got to keep my. I move my cursor around too much. It's a bad habit. Um, and uh, this one is on a sunflower. This is a wonderful uh, pollinator feeder for bees, all kinds of bees, native bees, and um, as well as some butterflies, but it, particularly bees. The flowers are actually quite deep. This is a composite flower. If you know anything about flowers, um, the inside of the the plant is a bunch of tiny flowers, and depending on the species, the outside, what look like what we call the petals, might be flowers or they might not. This particular flower is the Helianthus annuus, so the annual sunflower. These are the big sunflowers you see in farms that people used to grow for sunflower seeds. But there are many other types of, of sunflowers. Some of them are tall, some of them are small. Uh, the Helianthus species, Helianthoids, and they're all wonderful pollinator plants. Uh, if you're interested in photographing pollinators, having something with a load, a whole load of these little tiny flowers means that the bee or the butterfly or whatever it happens to be will spend a lot of time on that flower. And that gives you a great, great chance to get your camera focused and the picture taken. This is a flower, the Philadelphia fleabane, that most people think of as a weed. It often comes up all by itself in your lawn. And it looks kind of weedy, and it sheds all of its petals. If you decide you want to pick it for a, a bouquet, it sheds all the petals very quickly. But it's about, it's less than half an inch in diameter. And as you can see, there's a little tiny bee. This is one of our native bees. It's either a, a digger bee. I think it's a type of digger bee, possibly a minor bee. It looks more like a digger bee, though, which is a, another small bee that digs holes in the ground and lays its eggs there. Uh, very good pollinator. If you look at its legs, you can see they've got, they, they don't have baskets like the honeybees do, but the entire leg is hairy and the entire leg area picks up the pollen on the sides. Um, these are weedy looking plants. Uh, they grow up in my lawn. I always leave a patch of them for these tiny bees because there are a lot of little bees that really like them. Uh, so you have to think um, that you are leaving some plants or planting some plants for the pollinators and not for yourself. You have to be selfless. <laughs> Here's a, another one. Uh, this is a green, one of the green sweat bees. Green sweat bees are so called because they like to they they like to get salt from sweat on animals. They will often land on you if you're out in the in the garden. Uh, the digger bee I showed you before has no sting. These sweat bees have no sting. They they actually look a bit more like flies. They they bode you no harm at all. They don't sting, and so you can just go out and and enjoy them close up without any worries. And you can see over here how the legs of this bee are simply covered in pollen, all the hairs on the thorax and everything, the front legs, and this little bee, tiny as it is, is going to be able to do a very good job of pollinating some other flower with all that pollen. Uh, these, are, uh, these kinds of bees are called intentional pollinators because they are going looking for pollen. This is something that they used to feed their uh, feed their uh, larvae with. So um, they look for pollen and they look for nectar. Okay, let me get my, oops, okay, sorry. Yes, I do want to do that. Okay, this is a plant that you might be finding in your lawns if you're lucky enough to, uh, or smart enough to um, do something I heard the other day called no mow may. So you just let whatever comes up in your yard come up. Um, where I live, and if you are living maybe in, in parts of suburbia, you might still be lucky enough to have these plants coming up spontaneously in your yard, the spring beauty. And they are quite beautiful, very small flowers, but they have a very interesting relationship with a very specific pollinator. That pollinator is the spring beauty mining bee. Now there are quite a few different species of um, mining bees. All many of them, I won't say all of them, but you never say any, always, any of those, you know, um, exclusionary uh, words if you're a biologist, because there's always some exception to the rule that will come along and you know, somebody's gonna say, oh, well, what about that? Yeah, yeah. 
So most mining bees have very specific relationships with very specific flowers. And the spring beauties only come up in the spring and you only see the spring beauty mining bees in the springtime. Their, their uh, fates are entwined. And uh, spring beauties have pink pollen. So you can see that this little bee is covered all over in pink pollen as well. This is um, a picture. I, I sat out in my front yard for a couple of hours when I was preparing this the presentation, trying to get a picture of a mining bee, a spring beauty mining bee on spring beauty. And if they don't, this is, they're, they're sort of on and off very quickly. So every time I would get my camera focused, I didn't man, actually never managed to get my own photo. So this is from my good friend, Marianne Borge, uh, who does a wonderful blog. It's called The Natural Web. I've got the, um, uh, I, I've got the, um, the, the link for the Spring Beauty story, but she does a lot of wonderful photographic nature stories on her blog. You should really go and look for it. She's um, a fellow naturalist at Bowman's Hill Wildflower Preserve, and she takes wonderful, wonderful photographs of, of butterflies and flowers. And she, her, her, um, I think you would find her blog very, very logical. She used to be a mathematician, you know, step by step, taking you through the the relationships between these um, various things. It's really, really amazing. And this, these are spring beauties. Some of them are very pale. This is out on the lawn. And this shows, um, this is a, an American lady butterfly. This is one of the migratory butterflies, um, also nectaring on spring beauty. So it's not just the spring minor bee, but other small bees and butterflies that arrive. This is very early in the spring. Uh, these these uh, butterflies have... Um, a longer migratory route in some cases than than monarchs, and yet nobody seems to know that they're they're actually more than. Well, some people think all butters are butterflies are migratory, which is not true, and then some people think only monarchs are migratory, which is also not true. This is what my lawn looks like. Well, it looked like this about uh, maybe three weeks ago, so you can see it's full of spring beauties. And the heart-shaped leaves that you can see here are all blue violets, uh, common blue violets. Most of them are common blue. We do have a couple of other species as well. But that's blue. those blue violets are also great pollinator plants for nectar. And they also serve as host plants for some butterfly caterpillars. But before we get to that, let's have a look at another pollinator. This one is the two-lined leatherwing beetle. It's a type of um, what they call blister beetles, and many species of blister beetles are pollinators. And they, but they don't go to the flower for the nectar. They're going for the insects that are on the flower. And in so doing, they pick up pollen and spread it to the next flower. And then they lay their eggs on or near decaying wood. So. Don't forget that everything in nature is a niche for something. And if you, you should leave some tree limbs, if you have any little wooded area, or even just make a brush pile or have a little area in your yard, if it's too unsightly, just you know put it in an area that's not too conspicuous and leave some decaying wood for things like beetles that lay their eggs on or near decaying wood. And then the larvae in turn, when they hatch out of the eggs, eat insects that are found in the decaying wood or the soil underneath it. This is a nice pollinator plant that is blooming right now. This is another one that comes up usually in, in lawns that are wet or wet meadows. Um, they, these are tiny little flowers. They look like small, what's hard, they look a little bit like daisies with yellow petals. And um, they, they have long flower stems that come up because they grow they do tend to grow with grass. So this, if you must, you have a lawn and you must mow it, all you have to do is let these flowers do their thing, let them come up, let them produce, produce seeds, and then you can just mow them down after that because the basal leaves are lower than uh, the level at which you normally would mow a lawn. So you, you can actually have these uh, brighten up your lawn, feeding blister beetles, and then just get rid of all the evidence if you just can't stand to see fuzzy seeds all over the place and, and dying flowers. Win-win situation for the neatnik and for the beetle. 
here's a, a, a really interesting plant. It's called wild ginger. And uh, I took this picture today, actually, because they just happen to be blooming right now. So you can see this is the flower of this. It, it lies right on the ground at the base. This is the base here, the base of the, the stems right here. This is lying right on the ground. And that is because it's, it's, it is um, attract, trying to attract beetles, flies, and ants, which are what pollinate it. But the interesting thing is it's that it's, the leaves are host plant for caterpillars of the pipe vine swallowtail butterfly. And that's not a, that's not, we don't see many pipe vines around here anymore. We also don't, and probably associated with that, we don't see very many uh, pipe vine swallowtail butterflies over here. And here's what they look like. That's the butterfly, these little swallowtails here. And this, this, is a, this was done by a man named Tim Wong who lives in California, this particular picture here. And he's been studying the uh, pipe vine swallowtail um, uh, butterfly and, so, and all the different, these are called instars. So, you know, you start off, I'll show you this in a minute with a, a monarch egg, but you start off with an egg and you, the caterpillar actually quite rapidly goes through several different stages of, um, of development before it finally goes off and forms a chrysalis and eventually turns into the butterfly. But this is, if you're looking for ground cover, this is wonderful. These are what the leaves look like right now. Um, pretty soon they're going to get pretty big, maybe eight inches across or something like that. This is going to be completely covered with these um, wild ginger leaves. They're a lovely shade of green. They don't need any direct sun. In fact, they don't like direct sun. So if you've got a shady spot under a tree that's a little bit damp uh, and you want some, some ground cover to keep the, the uh, stilt grass or whatever kind of weeds are growing there, this is a great plant to try. And it's very easy to grow too. Um, wasps, not just bees, but wasps are also important. Um, so th this is another intentional pollinator. The adults are going after the pollen and, pollen and the nectar that, um, that the plant provides to them. Um, and the plant, this, this is a plant, this plant is a goldenrod. Uh, you see a lot of those in fields. Um, they look kind of weedy. Uh, they look magnificent actually, but they are such an important plant in the fall when insects are getting ready to, um, when they're trying to feed themselves. And in some cases they're feeding um, uh, larvae that will overwinter in the larval form, but they need some energy to do that. And so uh, goldenrods and other members of the aster species are really, really important. I'm not sure what kind, there are many different kinds. I'm gonna to talk to you about a couple of kinds you might wanna try in your own garden that aren't so big and weedy and some, some goldenrods can get really big and tall. You may not want that, but, but you've got choices. They're all good. This is a, I just love these gray hair streak butterflies. This is a purple cone flower. You probably, these grow pretty easily um, everywhere. This is a very, very good pollinator plant. You may notice that this one has got holes in its leaves. There are some uh, insects that actually eat the petals off this, the flower. And in the meantime, you've got this lovely butterfly, um, which is feeding on the cone flower. And you also have one of those little green sweat bees that's feeding on it at the same time. So th these uh, gray hair streak butterflies um, overwinter as eggs. And the sweat bees, um, uh, what else do I, oh, so the larval food for the gray hair streak is, is not the purple cone flower. It happens to be, um, they, they um, will f um, feed on a number of plant species, but they prefer prefer legumes and mallows. And uh, one of one an interesting little plant that is a legume here is called the hog peanut, which is a, if you're looking for a uh, little vine for a shady ear, it's a very delicate, um, a delicate vine with interestingly shaped leaves. This is another all round, easy to grow, uh, can become invasive in, in the sense that it's going to spread all over the place, but you can keep it um, under control by um, 
cutting back the seed heads in the fall so that it doesn't reseed itself all over the place. But this is a wonderful plant, wonderful, um, wonderful pollinator plant for moths and butterflies and bees. It's got everybody covered there. Okay. Now, um, I said earlier that if you have been gardening for uh, a number of years, you probably haven't been seeing as many butterflies as you used to see. And the ones you are seeing, I bet, if you are seeing a lot of butterflies, are cabbage white butterflies. Uh, they could be white, and in early spring, the males tend to have some um, a little bit of black in them. They can also appear to be a pale yellow color. This, th these butterflies have three to five um, generations every year. Uh, they were a Eurasian introduction and their host plants are in the mustard family. So they're mostly, uh, um, uh, which includes cabbages, cruciferous vegetables, things like that, cabbages, kale, broccoli, etc. So they're a real pest of some of the invasive plants that we grow to eat as vegetables and they were introduced along with those plants. That's what the caterpillar looks like. Now the good thing is that birds do like to eat these caterpillars. So if you maintain a good healthy bird population along with your crops, you're going to have a lot less of a problem with even an invasive um, butterfly and butterfly caterpillar like this one. Everything is kind of connected. Oh, this plant, by the way, if you're wondering, this uh, is an obedient plant. Uh, that's another plant that grows very easily. It's uh, quite an interesting one, but again, it's, uh, as we say at Bowman's Hill, it's not very obedient. It will grow all sorts of places you don't want it. However, if it's, if it's attracting butterflies, you might not mind that. So uh, I mentioned earlier, growing in lawns, you will often find the common blue violet. And this is a host plant for the great spangled tritillary butterfly. This is a big butterfly. It's really beautiful and it is fatally, fatally attracted to the color red. So my husband had put a bunch of these little red flags into the lawn to mark um, plants. I've totally got him into, you know, native plants now. So that's working. He's out there working away all the time, taking out invasives and, uh, you know, and finding things. And so he had put a bunch of these flags in the lawn and this poor great spangled fritillary was going from flag to flag to flag to flag to flag without finding anything to eat. So I had to pull up all the flags and point it to the red flowers in the backyard. I now, but I do butterfly counts um, in July. There's a annual butterfly count run by NAB, a North American Butterfly Association. And I always bring one of these red flags with me so I can um, attract fritillaries closer so we can identify which species of fritillary they are. Works like a charm. <laughs> now this is an interesting, very beautiful butterfly. It's every bit as shiny and iridescent as it looks in this picture, the red spotted purple. This is, um, this is a butterfly that um, mostly use wood mostly uses woody plants as a host plant so th this is one that requires trees if you can have a tree in your yard plant an oak white oak if you only have room for one tree but you can also find a lot of woody shrubs um you know there are there are things in these different um plants in some of these plant families that don't grow into big trees they can there are little shrubs that can be kept under uh, control and you will get something beautiful like this. This one's an easy uh, butterfly to feed. It does feed on floral nectar to some extent, but it actually prefers tree sap, especially in the spring, rotting fruit, carrion, and dung. So it's really easy to feed. You just throw all your garbage out there and this butterfly will come and feed on it. Actually, I've seen large numbers of them feeding on uh, fallen fruit in late summer. This particular plant, if you don't have any uh, asters or golden rods in your garden, it's called Sedum Autumn Joy. It's not a native sedum, but it is very, very popular with um, with pollinators in the fall. So this it grows pretty slowly. It's not really, it's not an obnoxious invasive. And um, if this is, you know, if you don't have very much room, this would be, and these are also very easy to grow, this would be a good um, alternative fall nectar plant. It blooms in late summer, early fall. 
of course, everybody's favorite butterfly, the monarch. The larval food for the monarchs are different types of milkweeds. So the ones you should be considering are common milkweed, swamp milkweed. We've already talked about that. This one is feeding on, a, this is a common milkweed. And butterfly weed is another great, easy to grow um, um, monarch food. Uh, the adult always feeds on floral nectars quite a wide variety. So if you have, if you're providing food for these, for the caterpillars, you will, you will see a lot of these uh, feeding on other flowers in your garden. Um, this is one on swamp milkweed, my favorite milkweed. And left behind an egg. So this is the monarch egg. And one thing I've noticed, which is rather interesting, is when they're growing, at least on plants outdoors, is that the larvae, this is the, when it's just freshly hatched, chews a hole, it hatches out of the egg and chews a hole through the, the leaf and emerges on the underside at first. And, I, and then later on, as it gets bigger, it appears on the top of the leaf too. And I wondered why that was, and then I, little bit of research told me that um, the, the egg has no has none of the um, none of the toxins of the milkweed leaf in it the caterpillar has to get those into its body by eating the leaves so when it first emerges it's very very vulnerable so it's pretty smart that it starts out on the underside of the leaf and then only when it's fully protected does it end up on the upper side and lots of other things like swamp milkweed too. Um, these are different. These are Zabulon skippers are little butterflies that look a little bit like um, moths. A lot of people don't realize that they're actually butterflies. Here we've got, uh, this is the female over here and there's a male and here they are getting together. Actually, there looks like a threesome going on up here. Two males with this one very attractive female, obviously. So this is the, uh, this, that's the butterfly dating bar. Eastern tiger swallowtails, one of our largest uh, butterflies, also like swamp milkweed to, to nectar on. Um, interestingly enough, this uh, the tiger swallowtail is thought to be one of the major pollinators of tulip trees. And it eats a variety, the, the larvae eat a variety of mostly tree, um, tree leaves. This one overwinters as a chrysalis in a state of diapause. So in other words, it's formed the chrysalis and then it has just stopped. And so these chrysalises are usually hanging from tree leaves somewhere or tree branches. This one again, I mentioned is on the. And this is, this is another great pollinator. This is a hummingbird moth, one of the clear wing moths, also on swamp milkweed. You can see why I like this plant so much. And I have a little video here that I'm going to try and play for you that shows what this looks like. You can find lots of, of native honeysuckles that are lovely. I'll show you some later. Viburnum is a great small tree to grow in your yard if you've got a, a slightly shady damp spot. Blueberries also. And this one is on swamp milkweed again. I think those are just the most amazing looking things. Oops, okay. Again, tiger swallowtail. This is a, uh, I think that's a spice bush swallowtail, and uh, a bumblebee nectaring on swamp milkweed. There's a problem with milkweed though, and that's oleander aphids. Oleanders are not native to the United States, and neither are the aphids. And they really can do a lot of damage to your plants. And this is the only insect in my garden that I kill. And I kill it using this. This is the safest if you must kill something. And sometimes if you want to save the blooms on your, on your swamp milkweed or other milkweeds, if you've got a bad aphid year, you might have to use this. The thing to do is uh, it kills by clogging the spiracles of soft-bodied insects. So it will kill um, caterpillars also. However, it doesn't leave a toxic residue. It's just soap, basically. Washes off the plant with rain or you can water after you've sprayed your aphids. Leave it on for a little while and then just water the plant and you'll wash off a lot of the aphids too. And it doesn't persist in the environment. 
So it's the only thing. I wish they didn't make it sound so, so dangerous, like insect killing soap, you know, killing insects is just way overrated. We have to stop thinking about killing insects, but if you have to do it, do it in the safest way possible. Uh, you can if you can you can even use this if you actually have caterpillars on your plant. So you just take them all off, put them in a little dish or something, spray your aphids, and then you can put the caterpillars caterpillars right back on the plant, and they will go on eating. They won't be harmed at all. This is another great plant that grows well in small spaces. They will grow well in pots. They only grow a couple of feet tall anyway. They are related to cardinal flowers, so they're in the, they're lobelias, and everything likes these. Uh, this is a spicebush swallowtail butterfly that is nectaring on the great blue lobelia. Uh, these do need a little bit of dampness. This one is growing right up from in between two bricks in our brick patio, and that that's a perfect. If you don't have a really good wet place to keep these, you can just plant them with some rocks around them or something. Um, to keep uh, the um, moisture in the soil from evaporating or put them in a pot. You can grow, if you grow them in a pot about this side of, so size over here, you can put several in there. Um, and uh, they like full sun uh, or part shade. They will grow well in part shade as well, especially if they're not particularly wet and uh, they're a fabulous pollinator plant. Here's a this one, this is also the flower of the, the uh, blue lobelia, the great blue lobelia, uh, it, but it's not a butterfly. It's called a butterfly wannabe. It's an orange mint moth. It's a day flying moth. And the, the larval food, as the name suggests, is a variety of mints. So wild bergamot, which is another good plant. If you have a, that's kind of a big plant, uh, more for uh, like a meadow kind of a setting, but it's, a, but you can't, you can grow those in, in pots too. If you do, they will stay shorter. And, and more manageable for a small space, but they're a great pollinator plant. And they will also be larval food for this absolutely beautiful little moth. Again, the adults uh, overwinter as pre-pupa in plant debris, another thing that a lot of us are throwing away at the end of the season. Okay, oh, again, that's the spice bush swallowtail butterfly. So the spice bush swallowtail butterfly um, uses, as the name suggests, spice bush, um, which is an important understory plant where I live in the Sourland Mountain. Uh, spice bush thickets are um, predominant understory in certain places like um, Ball Paint Mountain, for example, where there are several species of uh, uh, warblers that are rare to this part of the state that use that spice bush thicket um, understory habitat to breed. They will not breed in multiflora rows or uh, barberry or any of the other invasives that have pushed the spice bush out in many areas. So spice bush is a good thing to plant. If you, it's not, they turn into, maybe they get to be about 10 feet tall when they're mature, but again, you could, you could keep those smaller if you wanted to, but they're, they're uh, wonderful if you want to have any chance at all of seeing spice bush swallowtail. Um, and these beautiful, this one is kind of at the end of its uh, life cycle, so it's gotten a little bit dull, but when you see these flittering through the woods as they're going, looking for spice bush to lay their eggs on, it's really a wonderful sight. They also use sassafras and sweet bay. Those are, um, sweet bay is a sweet bay magnolia. That's another nice plant to, to grow too, if you have the space for it. And here's a, if you've got a muddy spot, this is very difficult to grow things. We found some of these um, winged monkey flowers uh, and underneath a big pile of suffocating uh, stilt grass. My husband pulled up all the stilt grass and we found these little poor plants underneath. There's the little monkey flowers, so-called because they're, if you've got a good imagination, they're, they're, uh, the flowers kind of look like monkey faces. I personally don't see it myself, but then I did not name the plant. Um, and uh, they're also host plant for a buckeye butterfly, and I don't have a photograph of that, but if you've ever seen one, that's a very pretty patterned butterfly, and it's becoming rarer in our area, maybe because the, the monkey flowers are becoming rare. So they need uh, organically rich, moist to wet soils in part shade. You can actually buy um, 
if you wanted to try seeding a muddy spot, you could turn your a muddy spot into a thing of beauty. And uh, Toadshade Wildflower Farm is a great place to get a whole assortment of wildflower seeds of all kinds. Comes with very good instructions on how to grow them um, and where to grow them. And they also sell plants. So that's a place to look into. Another thing, I just put this slide in to remind me to tell you that, that when butterflies first emerge from, uh, from their chrysalises, they need to get some certain minerals that uh, are required <clears throat> for the, their adult stage. And they get that by mudding or puddling. Uh, they usually look for damp mud, gravel. In some of the butterfly gardens that I've visited in various parts of the world, they actually provide little patches of gravelly mud for their hatch, hatching out, uh, uh, their eclosing rather butterflies. These are uh, cloudless sulfur. And, whoops, I want to go back there. And um, they use, um, the, you notice the name is Phoebus senna, and they also they do use senna. That's another plant. That's a native plant that you can grow here. It's it's kind of large and unwieldy, but sulfur butters butterflies love it. Several uh, species of sulfur butterflies will use uh, senna as a host plant. One of my favorite flowers, and this is the our bird pollinator, the hummingbird. It is thought to be the primary, if not the only, um, pollinator of the beautiful cardinal flower, Lobelia cardinalis. The flower is just the most gorgeous shade of red, and you can see uh, up here is all the, uh, the business end of the plant here, and the nectar is way down here at the bottom. It's perfectly designed for a hummingbird to stick its bill all the way down here to get the nectar while its head rubs, rubs up against the male and female parts of the flower up here, picking up pollen from that flower and depositing whatever is collected from the previous flower onto it. Perfect, perfectly designed and evolved with hummingbirds. Um, so this sends up a big, big flower spike. These plants really do like water. They grow, they grow in shade. They will grow in full sun, but you really need to keep them wet. They don't like to be mulched. They like to have this rosette of basal leaves. This is, a cut, this is cut back for the winter and the stems are here. So this is another one that goes very, very flat um, after, the, after it has flowered. And if you just want to cut it down afterwards, you can do that and uh, it'll be fine. Come back next year. It's a short life perennial. So I've had them last five, the individual plants last five or six years and uh, they get huge in, in that time, taller than I am. And I'm five foot two, so these plants get to be, a, but they, they it takes a few years before they get to be really, really tall. Here's a cloudless sulfur butterfly attempting to uh, nectar on a uh, cardinal flower, and this is a black swallowtail butterfly also, but you, that's rare. They will come to the flowers, but I don't think they get much satisfaction because they're not quite anatomically correct for that flower. And they can be grown en masse, and it's really a spectacular sight, especially when you see multiple hummingbirds hovering around that patch. Uh, if you live in deer country, um, you will have a very hard time seeing like that because the deer love to eat the flower buds and it's interesting because the uh, these plants do contain a toxin called lobeline um, so the deer don't eat them all at once they will come back and when they get a stomach ache then i think they'll go away and come back the next day but they do love love the flower buds they will also eat the seed pods in the fall so they have to be protected but this is a lovely little patch if you have the right conditions to have sometimes not every year but uh, the uh, cardinal flowers bloom first, and the the um, the so-called blue cardinal flowers, or the lobelia, lobelia syphilitica, will bloom later. Uh, but often the bloom overlaps, and they just look wonderful together. It's a lovely little part shade type of flower arrangement, and you will have your hummingbirds and your butterflies all in the same spot. This is another lobelia that we find. It's called Indian tobacco. Um, it's a much smaller plant with tiny flowers, and this one is is um, this one is uh, friendly to our tiny native bees. And you, these you will often find growing just spontaneously, turning up in among the rest of the lobelia. So I would highly rec recommend 
experimenting with the lobelia patch for small, medium, and large live pollinators. This is a morning cloak butterfly. These are around right now if you live in the right place. Um, they mostly use trees and deciduous, uh, deciduous trees and shrubs as, as um, host plants, and the adults do feed on some plant nectar. These ones are feeding on an, another invasive plant, but I've seen them on, uh, this is um, vinca or periwinkle, another European or Eurasian invasive. invasive. Um, so they do feed on a bit of nectar, but they really like tree sap, which is much more available in the spring. When the sap starts flowing in the spring, a lot of these early emerging butterflies have learned how to, how to uh, live on tree sap. And some of them even use sap wells that's been dr drilled by um, yellow belly sap suckers. But th in this case, the, the adults overwinter under fallen leaves. And every time I see these bags of leaves out by the curb, I wonder how many morning cloak butterflies are in the bag along with the leaves. Uh, we're seeing fewer and fewer of these now. And here's uh, Vanessa, uh, the American lady butterfly we talked about earlier. The larval food for this one is, is pearly everlastings and pussy toes. This is what pussy toes look like. I took this picture. I just, I had a, I had an earlier version of this one, but this is blooming right now. And the, these little white flowers are why it's called pussy toes, but it's not a very attractive plant overall, especially when the caterpillars of this butterfly come and eat all the leaves off it. But you know, you can just put it, it's a very hardy little plant. It grows really well. It does recover about uh, a month after the caterpillars are finished with it, the leaves come back. Um, Grow a few of these for these, um, these poor butterflies that have come all the way from Central America. They have a longer migration than the monarchs in some cases, and some of them go all the way up to Canada before they start the next generation. And, um, and you will be doing this beautiful butterfly a big favor. This is what it looks like on the, uh, is that the, I'm getting you. This is the painted lady butterfly. So this is another. Um, this is another uh, Vanessa butterfly. Um, there are various ways we don't have to go into now how to tell the these apart. Um, but it looks very much like the one I just showed you. And the underwing. This is what the underwing looks like. So it looks different on the top and the bottom. Beautiful both ways. And this is on an aster in the fall. Uh, this is one of the small flowered asters. I think it might be a heath aster or possibly a calico. It's a little bit hard to tell without a lot of lot further um, analysis, but this is a one of the best pollinator types of pollinator plants, these small flowered asters in the fall. They are just humming with, with pollinators. Third member of the Manessa um, family that comes here to New Jersey, the Red Admiral. This one has various types of nettles. Some people eat stinging nettles, but uh, there are nettles you can get like wood nettles if you have a little shady spot that don't sting, um, that can provide food for the larvae of this absolutely gloriously beautiful butterfly. It's beautiful on the top and it's beautiful on the underside too. This one, um, this one was taken from a little table I have on my kitchen porch. So I guess I must have nettles someplace. I haven't found them yet, but obviously the butterfly did. So, whoops, fall is all about asters, um, like the, so the white asters. The, uh, these are uh, goldenrods. They're also members of the aster family. They are covered with, especially with butterflies in the fall, but also the smaller uh, bees, smaller native bees use those. Now, these are my two favorite plants to grow in my yard. Um, they're smaller than the others. They grow in shade. They did not light shade, not very heavy shade, but they will grow in shady places. This is the blue stem, um, also known as a wreath goldenrod. The flowers grow in the, the axles of the leaves all along the stem. They produce these beautiful arching shapes. Uh, these, this is a close-up of the flowers of the blue wood aster. They have heart-shaped leaves. They get pretty tall, but you can trim them down um, if you start trimming them in, like, the, maybe give them a trim in May and then in June, you will get a shorter plant with, um, with which is bushier. 
maybe uh, they, they can get to be pretty tall. They can get up to be four or five feet tall if you just let them go, and that might be just too too overwhelming for some some places. But when you put those together, this is uh, underneath a tulip tree. It creates just a very, very beautiful um, picture in the fall. It's quite long lasting. It will last for a few weeks. And if you're, you just listen quietly, you can just hear a hmm of all the bees that are just covering these flowers. And none of them are interested in stinging you. All they're interested in is, is putting away enough energy for, the, for fall and winter. Um, asters in particular have been heavily cultivated, so a cultivar is a cultivated variety of a native plant or some other type of plant that's native somewhere, but um, they're usually developed to enhance their appeal to homo sapiens, so bigger flowers, different colored flowers, resistance to insects, etc. But if you're going to be buying a cultivar, think about what may be lost. So some some of these have no, roses are a prime example of that. A lot of um, cultivated, the fancy species of roses have totally lost their fragrance. And, and fragrance is something, they're chemicals that, that these pollinators use to find the flowers that they need. Um, the, the colors, you know, Mother Nature, I think, knows best when it comes to colors. Um, insects can see and birds can see colors that we can't see. So if we're changing the color of a flower, we may also be changing the attractiveness of that flower to the birds and insects, so they will never find it. Um, and the other thing is, especially if you um, are going for insect resistance, the plant may no longer be palatable or able to be used by caterpillars. And so if you can't, if you can't feed the caterpillars, if you're not considering caterpillars in your garden when you're considering pollinators, you're not gonna have any pollinators after a while. So mother knows best. So, you know, there are some cultivars um, that have been found to produce more nectar and things like that. But if, you know, you really, if you really want to be a good friend to nature, you might just want to plant the originals. A good place to get those is places like Bowman's Hill Wildflower Preserve, which locally sources its native plants. So they're actually native to the Piedmont eco region, which is uh, where we're located too. And, um, and it's, it's, you know, they, these are plants that have evolved to be in this uh, area, to grow in this area, and to feed the animals in this area. So everybody, if you haven't read this book, Nature's Best Hope by Doug Tallamy, you must get it. You can also go to his website if you haven't discovered this yet. It's called homegrownnationalpark.org, Tallamy's Hub, and find uh, a a lot of information about the importance of insects to our environment and about how what to plant in your yard. He has um, a 10 acre uh, property that he bought an, um, a number of years ago um, and he, he's been using that as, a, as an outdoor laboratory planting um, trees and, and various native plants and then documenting all the insects that he has managed to attract. It's absolutely fabulous. It's very inspiring. Uh, again, Marianne Bork's uh, Borg blog, the naturalweb.org, and wearethearc.org is another great uh, movement that was started by Mary Reynolds, an Irish woman, a woman who lives in Ireland. Um, and it's become a worldwide phenomenon, and she talks about uh, being kind to nature, but the thing that really um, amazes me about her is she talks about being kind to people who are not being kind to nature to try and convince them that they need to be. In other words, taking a kindness approach to every angle of this, this problem to restore our planet. Finally, from the Xerxes Society, uh, the Xerxes Society is, um, is named after a butterfly that went extinct within many of our lifetimes. Um, it's a memorial to that. They are um, um, protectors of um, invertebrates, basically, but, it, but particularly uh, butterflies and moths at the moment. And uh, so the, I've got a bunch of signs that I've put up in my house um, to explain why my yard looks so messy, because a little messiness is is uh, 
very compatible with um, being a good pollinator gardener. So if your neighbor thinks you're crazy or just plain lazy, but the little guys know you're a real hero when you leave the leaves, this is, um, this is really important. We're only now coming to realize just how important leaves, just fallen leaves are on the ground to the to the survival of so many pollinators. This is actually a butterfly cocoon. It looks just like a dead leaf. It's attached to a twig somewhere. It may fall off at some time during the winter and end up buried in leaves. And if you're going to chop that up in a in a in in some sort of a machine, whether you roll over it with a lawnmower or put it into the hopper of a, of a chipper or something like that, uh, you're going to be destroying some potential butterfly lives. This is a luna moth. Now this is an interesting moth. It, you may notice it has almost no head here and very little body. That's because it does not eat. It only lives for a couple of weeks. It doesn't eat. Its only uh, reason raison d'etre is to reproduce but if you've ever seen one, it's such a spectacular sight that you do want to see them again. So even though it's not strictly speaking a pollinator, um, you don't want to throw some of these away in the garbage with your leaves. I'm sure once you've seen one, you wouldn't. And here's everybody's favorite, the little woolly bear caterpillar, which also burrows beneath fall fallen leaves and overwinters as an adult. Um, and if you get rid of those leaves, or if you blow them away, if you if you you know if you have them in, in certain areas in your yard and you just decide you're going to blow the leaves away, you may be uncovering these, especially if you do it late in the fall, and then you won't get any more woolly bear caterpillars. It turns into an Isabella tiger moth, by the way. Um, here's another one: caterpillars. So these these are the fritillary butterflies that we saw earlier. They come out fairly early in the spring. Uh, and again, they overwinter as caterpillars. And then they, once uh, spring comes, they form a chrysalis and turn into adults. But if you, if you take away their leaves, if you, if you disturb the leaves too, this is the other thing where they, they found a cozy place and maybe made a little chrysalis and everything. If you go in and start messing around with those leaves, you could be um, setting them up to die over the winter. Leaves are important. Uh, this is a great blog where you can find out about more of what creatures uh, uh, spend the winter underneath the fallen leaves. It will be eye-opening for you. So chesapeakebay.net news slash blog slash life underscore under underscore the underscore fallen underscore leaves. Okay, and that is all I have for tonight. That's fantastic, Bonita. Thank you so much. Honestly, I was like, oh, I know all this stuff. And I really didn't know all this stuff at all. I learned oh, so much so this glad. evening. You got something new. <laughs> so I'm really grateful. And I also appreciate that you uh, provided so many resources because one of my uh, you know, starting questions was, you know, it is, there is so much to know. And you sort of hinted at this the importance of being aware, not just of what you're planting, but of the, sort of the greater systems and how they interact. And I think it can be daunting. So like, if you were to recommend, you know, a couple of things, if somebody's starting out, what are some of the best places for them to, to go and not like necessarily apprentice, but to be able to talk to people if they're. Well, um, it's not just because I'm a volunteer naturalist at Bowman's Hill Wildflower Preserve, but that's a fabulous place to get information about native plants specifically. They have a lot of them on their plant floors. If you just tour the preserve, you will you will see a lot of plants in their native habitats. Um, they also offer lots of courses on uh, various aspects of native plants. Um, and you can just go and, and take maybe take a tour with one of the naturalists. We do uh, tours. Uh, uh, I think it's we're doing Friday, Saturday, Sunday now during the summer and everything. You will learn a lot, um, you know, and actually be able to see what's growing in what season. Uh, they have a um, um, what do they call it? It's like a like a demonstration garden where you can you know with with thing where you look at plants. Oh, I like that one, and you can look it up and see where it grows and see how big it gets and see whether it would be something that you could uh, 
you know, fit into your own garden. And you don't have to, the plants are sometimes expensive to buy plants. I have to say the ones that I've bought from Bowman's Hill are really great. I, sometimes I don't even get them in the ground and I'm, the next year they're back they are, you know, they're so well rooted and everything. But you can, you can start a lot of plants from seed. And you can start a lot of plants by just, you know, free sowing in the fall, you know, uh, right into the ground if you if you don't have time or space to put them all in pots and grow them that way. Or just, and, and I would just say, just experiment and also have a closer look at what's already coming up in your yard. Maybe it's something you've overlooked that could be a good pollinator plant. So f try and find out what it is. Uh, we were talking about iNaturalist. That's a, an app you can use to identify plants as well. Try and find out what it is and see if you want to keep it. Maybe you didn't really understand how how good a, a, a thing it could be to have in your garden. That's best. <laughs> right. Thank you so That's much. Free. Uh, Jennifer Eichmann asks, at what point um, do pollinators rise from the leaves in the spring? I find that I need to clean up the leaf debris in spring. Otherwise, some plants become unhappy. Well, unfortunately, they don't all do that at the same time. So the first ones out are going to be the ones that overwintered as adults. So like the morning cloak butterfly, for example. But then there are some that still have to go through some additional um, um, development. So the ones that like were sort of mid, uh, mid chrysalis, for example, are going to be coming out a little bit later. Most of them are probably, you're probably going to find most of them out like about now, most of the ones that have overwintered will be up. But, but if you leave your leaves that long, often you'll find the leaves are gone by that time too. They're already being broken down and used by other things. So, <laughs> but, um, but say the first, first week in May, you, you should be safe if you really, really need to get rid of some of those leaves. Uh, thanks so much. I will say that um, I took a course on permaculture with Oregon State University. And one of the things was talking about local resources. And I mentioned Bowman's Hill. And a number of people commented about, you know, even from Oregon State, how wonderful Bowman's Hill is a yes, local resource. We're so really lucky to have that also. Yes, it's very close by, just across yeah. the river. Um, I, you know, I don't have a ton of other questions, but I guess, you know, you, you mentioned Doug Tallamy. I should note that the library has all of Tallamy's books, <laughs> as well as um, a number of other wonderful plant resources about native plants in our region uh, that have been donated uh, by uh, Master Gardeners and uh, Friends of Princeton Open Space um, to sort of make people aware of what to do. And this program has been recorded. Uh, so you can go back and you'll be able to see all of the wonderful resources that Juanita offered um, throughout. And Juanita, I just can't tell you how grateful I am to have been able to hear your, your presentation because I really, <laughs> I learned a lot. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. I was glad to be able to do this for you. All right. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>